this uh, training is on email list management. And as I said, my name is Beth Allen, and I am uh, from Communications Workers of America. Uh, so if this is not the training you were expecting to be on, then no hard feelings if you decide to leave. Um, and this is part of a series of trainings, the One U Digital Training Series uh, that the ASL has been running, and there have been a ton of uh, great trainings preceding this one. Um, and I want to take a minute, for those of you who don't know, to explain what One U means. Uh, One U is the hashtag that we use on Twitter for anything that's related to unions. Um, so when you're tweeting, you can use One U, and that will uh, make sure that your tweets get the attention of other people in the labor movement, uh, so we can retweet and share information. Um, if you don't know uh, all about hashtags, you can always go to the Twitter 101 class. Uh, all the previous classes have been recorded and archived uh, at the One U Digital Training uh, series. If you just Google uh, AFL-CIO One U Digital Training, uh, you'll get to the page that has the archives for all of those uh, prior trainings, which are uh, definitely worth your time uh, if you are doing any kind of online work. So again, my name is Beth Allen. I'm the Online Communications Director at CWA. Uh, I have been working uh, in uh, online communications and digital strategies uh, for over 10 years now. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share some information with you today. Uh, about best practices for email list management. So today what I'm going to do is provide an overview of list management techniques that you can use uh, to increase the deliverability of your messages and improve your open and action rates. On the agenda, we'll talk a little bit about the path to the inbox, so what it takes to get your email uh, once it leaves salsa into someone's email box. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about list segmentation and why and how you do that. Talk a little bit about basic testing, uh, how to do some very sort of an introduction to, to using the testing tool in Salsa and again why you might want to do that. And then briefly review some other best practices for list management. As I was preparing the presentation, um, I realized there was so much more information out there uh, on some of these topics than I could possibly convey in an hour. And also that in some cases um, there may be some things that we're talking about that you haven't had a chance to learn yet with Salsa um, or want to know a little bit more about. So I uh, set up a resource page. Uh, and so the URL is here if you want to take a minute to jot it down. Uh, it's go.cwa-union.org slash 1u-list-management. And so on there I just put a link uh, to a few things. I'll make reference to some of those as I go along, uh, but uh, sort of additional reading and information and training that may be helpful to you if you're interested in email list management. So email. Uh, you know, it can be, as I was thinking about this presentation, um, and why we manage email lists. I was thinking about the road to the inbox. After you spend a lot of time writing your email, thinking about the content, getting your campaign set up, that's just the beginning of the process. All that hard work will go to waste if that email doesn't make it into people's inboxes and it doesn't get open. Now, to get to the inbox, the first thing you have to do is to prevent yourself from getting flagged as being spam. And to get the email read, you have to get the attention of your audience. And that audience has very limited information about your email when it arrives in the inbox. All that they have is the sender's name and the subject line in most cases. So your message has to seem relevant and interesting or important in order for that person to read it. Now, that matters for a lot of reasons. Um, so I'm going to take a little time here to talk about spam filters and uh, how they work and what triggers them, because uh, not everybody understands how they work and they don't understand why they sometimes get flagged as spam when there's nothing particularly spammy uh, about their message. So when spam filters first uh, came out, 
they really focused on the content of messages. They're looking for keywords and phrases, you know, talking about Nigerian princes or certain kinds of uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and the spam filters were looking for the keywords or phrases or sort of patterns, things like using all caps, things like using a lot more images and words uh, in order to, to decide if a message was spam. And then they also relied on lists blacklists or whitelists of good or bad email senders. So they would check, sort of do a scan of the content, see if it fits a pattern of being spam, and they would uh, do an electronic check of these blacklists or whitelists that services maintained in order to see if the sending server was on those lists. So that was sort of content-based spam filtering. Then, you know, over time, the volume of email increased and Spammers got wise to how spam filters were uh, identifying them, and so spam filters had to evolve. So the next generation of spam filters uh, continued to screen for content, so they did all the things they were already doing, but they also developed tools to assess a sender's reputation. So uh, what, what happened was a system evolved where people who sent email messages, like us, like Salsa, could create records in the domain name system that would tell a spam filter which email servers were authorized to send email messages so that spoofing uh, was more difficult to spoof messages. Um, they also added systems that allowed users to easily uh, report spam messages to ISPs with the click of a button so that ISPs could quickly react uh, to servers that were sending out spam. And then they also uh, set up spam traps. Uh, and spam traps are email messages, email addresses uh, that if you send to them, you're likely to be a spammer. I'm going to talk about that uh, a little more here um, because it has to, it relates directly to email uh, list management. So spam traps are addresses that the ISP sets up to lure spammers. But the thing is, they aren't made up addresses. They are spamtrap at gmail.com. So you can't sort of look at your list and say, oh, that's a spam trap. I'm not going to send to that email list. What they tend to do is that they use addresses of accounts that used to be good but are no longer used. So they use addresses from subscribers who have canceled or deleted their accounts. So in uh, this case, someone could have signed up for your list years ago then closed their account. And for a while after they've closed their account, you'll get a bounce message. So when you send the email out, get a message back that says this account is no longer valid. But it's tricky because if you don't regularly send messages to your list or you use an old list that someone found on their computer and you uploaded it to Salsa and started to email it, they could be filled with these older email accounts that were once valid but now are no longer valid. Um, so that's one of the big reasons to practice good email list management techniques so that you make sure that you're regularly emailing your list and that your list is less likely to have spam traps on it. So then the last thing about spam filters and kind of brings us up to where we are today is that uh, in the past couple years, uh, what spam filters have started to do is that they have used user engagement user engagement metrics to determine whether or not you are a spammer. And so in this way of looking at messaging, the ISP uh, keeps track of how many people open and click on links in messages that are sent from various email servers. And the lower percentage of the users who open your messages or click on your links, the more likely it is that the ISP will think that it's spam. You could be a legitimate sender, but if your messages have low appeal, they will end up in spam filters uh, for the major ISPs. And you know, we run into this a lot, and one of the things I'm seeing uh, a lot more lately, especially with Gmail, is that it's almost um, uh, unique to the user whether or not it ends up in the spam filter. So uh, we'll have people uh, who are all on Gmail, um, some of whom will get our newsletter just fine, and in some weeks the same newsletter for a different person will end up in the spam filter because they have not regularly opened it or clicked on links in it, or that it has ended up in the spam filter before and they've read it in the spam filter instead of 
first saying this is not spam and reading it from their regular inbox, and that can be a problem too. So that's sort of the new way uh, of trying to determine what is, in, is not spam, and it makes it a real challenge uh, for folks like us who send emails out regularly uh, because we really need to get those open rates and those click-through rates up on our messaging in order to uh, stay in the good graces of the ISPs and, and get past that first step, get the, the email from Salsa past the spam filters and into the inboxes of the people who want to, who want to have receive it. So the tips, general tips for avoiding spam filters are to send messages to the people who most want to see them, and to send engaging messages that people want to open and that get people to click or take action. So that sounds uh, pretty easy, right? Well, it's not easy. Um, and so I am going to give you some tips on how to best do that uh, through list segmentation and testing. So one technique you can do to make sure that you're sending messages to the people who most want to see them is to segment your list. And segmenting your list simply means that you're dividing your email list up into subgroups. Now these subgroups are generally either demographic or behavioral. So demographic information are things like what state someone lives in, what their political district is, and what their union, local, work location, or bargaining unit might be. So these are things that we often store in fields in Tulsa, either standard fields or custom fields. Uh, that you can create, or if you don't have the rights to do that within your chapter, someone else can create for you um, to store that demographic information. Information that uh, may change a little bit over time, but generally stays pretty static uh, with the record in the, in the email. Behavioral information, on the other hand, uh, is also stored automatically in Salsa, and you can access it there via query. So it's things like which past campaigns of yours have someone participated in, or whether they did or did not open a particular message. So that's um, behavioral information available in Salsa that you can use to segment your list. So let's look at some examples. This example here is of a demographic list segmentation uh, where I use congressional district to do the segmentation. So in Salsa, as uh, many of you probably know, since this is an advanced training and uh, you are probably all Salsa users, uh, you do your targeting, decide who you're going to send an email message to on the targeting tab of the email blast. Now, if for some reason, there may be a few of you who, who have um, not seen the tabs quite like this in Salsa because there is a view for sending email message, which is a simplified view that doesn't give you the wide range of choices. So if you don't uh, see these sorts of choices when you use Salsa, you should talk to whoever is working and managing your chapter uh, about that, uh, about whether you can get the more advanced version of the emailer. But in most cases, most of you uh, will see these tabs and will have the ability to do this kind of targeting with your messages. So here we're targeting based on congressional district. And you know the use case for this, the instance when we might do it, is if we were going to thank uh, some members of Congress for co-sponsoring legislation, and we're going to have others uh, to ask them to sign on as co-sponsors. So you wouldn't want to send a message uh, saying, thank you, a member of Congress, uh, for signing on to this legislation if they hadn't already signed on. Um, so this would help you target uh, both members of Congress better, but also uh, the potential uh, email recipients better so that they know that that message relates to them, relates to a member of Congress on an issue tracking. So that's an example of some demographic targeting uh, and list segmentation based on congressional district. And this screen is an example where we're targeting based on uh, the work type, the so work location uh, of members at AT&T Mobility. So in this case, we had set up a custom field in Salsa. This is not a field that's sort of automatically there in order to store their AT&T mobility workplace. So um, that allows us, in this case, to send a message out only to people in that bargaining unit with information that relates to them. So it'll have a higher open rate. More people will open it, take action, if there's an action to take in it, than if we had sent the same message to the whole list. Now I just wanted to, um, 
show you the form that we use to collect that information for that custom field because one of the things that will help you segment your list effectively is if you have good information to use as a basis for doing that segmentation. So here we collect the information on a custom form that we set up on our website. Uh, we find that bargaining is a really great time to get additional information from people because they're very motivated to sign up for the email list. They want to get information about bargaining, and so they'll take the time to give you additional information uh, instead of just their name and their email address. So in this case, we ask where do they work. Um, so we have that information, and that information is useful to us even after bargaining is over as we're doing messaging and communicating with our members. So another example, uh, and this example is behavioral targeting. So in this example, we are using the information that Salsa stores uh, in what's called the email status field that tells us uh, whether they've opened one of our recent CWA newsletters. So this might be a group of people who is uh, more likely to open the next message they get because they're regular readers of our newsletter. They would have a high open rate for a message that we sent them. So it, we may go to them with something uh, that is an issue that's important uh, to us, but you know isn't the sexiest issue out there. And so we want to uh, get people who are most engaged uh, to take action on the particular issue. Now, one thing to note, this is a sort of a salsa specific tip, is that if you are doing this kind of specific segmentation on email status, and you want to get everyone who opened a message, you have to choose both people who sent an open messages and people who sent and clicked messages. So people that you sent the message to and they opened it, plus people who you sent the message to and they clicked it. Because the sent and opened group does not include people who clicked the message. So in order to get the full picture of everyone who opened a message, you need to choose both of those email status types in order to select everyone um, who, are, who is known to have opened the message. It's also a good practice uh, to, to think about that and to think about people who clicked in addition to people who opened because of the way that Salsa and most other email systems uh, track who has opened a message. Um, when, in order to track who has opened a message, there's a tiny uh, invisible image uh, embedded in each message. And if an email program uh, that the person is using to read the message does not have images turned on, and most of them have images turned off by default uh, to prevent viruses and worms and other kinds of bad things, um, if, that, if those images are not turned on for message, it doesn't register as an open. So that can, be, that can make open rates seem lower than they are. They could have people opening your messages uh, and you don't really realize it. Um, so there's clicks, uh, but, but clicks are, you know, clicks are clicks, and it doesn't require images to be on in order to register a click. So you might, uh, when you're looking at your data, you may have a case where you see that someone has clicked on a message, but it doesn't say they ever opened it, which seems confusing, but in fact, uh, that's just because they opened the message, but they didn't have images turned on, and so uh, it's also didn't, uh, see that and didn't realize that the, the message had been opened. So that's a behavioral example. And then this is another uh, example uh, which is kind of behavioral because I am interested in people who registered for an event I was having, um, but it also involves groups. So in this case, I was sending a reminder message out to people about a call we were doing. And I wanted to suppress the people who had already signed up for the call because first of all, I didn't want to annoy them uh, by asking them to sign up for something that they'd already signed up for. And second of all, it would help boost my open rates because if you received a message saying sign up for the call and you had already signed up, you'd be unlikely to open mm -hmm. the message. You know, and even though that's logical behavior and doesn't really mean I'm sending spam, to internet service providers, email service providers, what that looks like is someone who's not interested in your message 
And so maybe a lot of people are interested in the message and maybe you're a spammer. So uh, what I did in this case, I used a, a system outside of Salsa uh, to have people register. So I imported a list of people who registered for the call into a group. And then when I did my Salsa select, I said, so people who are not members of the group should get this message. So that was another example of how to segment the list in a specific case in order to make sure the message gets to people who most want to see it. So I mentioned importing a list, and I wanted to just uh, give some words of caution about that since I mentioned it. Um, so importing lists is an important uh, way to keep your list updated, to get new uh, email addresses on your list, uh, to make sure people are hearing from you who want to hear from you, um, and to keep your list uh, growing. But it can also be a hazard because sometimes you're not sure where the list came from. So you want to be very careful that when you're importing lists that you know where they came from and you know that you have permission to send to the people on the list. So in my example where I know that they registered for a call and in the registration form uh, that they filled out, it said we're asking for your email address so that we can send you information and reminders, that's fine. You know, someone goes out in the field and they're collecting cards uh, to send to Congress or they're, you know, getting people who are at an event to sign up, that's fine. Someone finds a list on the computer, it's in Excel. They don't really remember where it came from, but it seems to have email addresses on it. They kind of want to give it to you because maybe we could try to email them. That's a little more suspicious, um, and you should be careful about that because, like I said, those old lists could have spam tra traps in them. And so you hit one of those spam traps, and immediately you get shut down uh, and get blocked from uh, sending messages. So you want to be very, very careful uh, about older lists or lists that you don't know where they came from. And then the final thing is not don't buy lists. Um, a lot of lists that are offered for sale, they sound too good for, to be true, often they are. Um, they are often just riddled with spam traps. Um, it's very, very dangerous to, to buy lists. So um, building your list organically, um, building your list from events, building your list from having people take action on campaigns is a much, much uh, smarter way to do it. Uh, than to go out and buy a list which could end up getting you into big trouble and hurting your whole email program. Those are just some tips on importing lists and keeping your email list healthy uh, while doing it. So that segmentation, um, you know, it's nothing particularly tricky about it. You'll need to be thoughtful uh, when you're segmenting to make sure that you have your data and your field set up in a way that helps you create useful segments. But it's a good technique to use, a good technique to use to help keep your list healthy. So testing. Testing is another technique. Um, segmenting as a technique helps you make sure you get the messages to the people who most want to see them. But that's only part of what you need to do to avoid spam traps and to make sure your message gets read. The other thing you need to do is to make sure that the messages you're sending are engaging and that people want to open them. There's an earlier training in this series, and I put a link to it on the resource page, uh, that discuss email best practices and how to write engaging emails. And I, uh, I encourage you to go back if you weren't able to participate in that training and take a look at the slides from that training because um, there's some really great tips on there on how to write engaging email copy, engaging what I'm going to talk a little bit about is that once you have your email written, how do you test to make sure that you're sending the best version of the email out possible, get the highest open rate, get the biggest number of clicks on that message. Um, so this screen is a sample of a test I did recently, uh, last week actually, which was part of the campaign uh, to see five members of the National Labor Relations Board. And this particular message was a request to call, um, so it did not have a very large click-through rate because the request wasn't uh, to take an online action that would involve a click. It just had the phone number right there in the body of the message, so the clicks 
are low for this and uh, not particularly relevant. But what I did is I tested three different subject lines for this message. Uh, one of them was breaking critical vote happened today. The other was this is it. And the third was tell Senate Democrats no compromise. And as you can see over here from the open rate, the open rate between the largest open rate and the smallest open rate is pretty significant. Pretty, pretty uh, big number of people uh, would not have opened in this test group the tell Senate Democrats no compromise, and they would have opened this is it or breaking critical vote happening today. Now, I ended up, I'm going to walk through screen by screen how you do this kind of testing. Um, so we'll go over it in detail. But I ended up with this one, choosing breaking critical vote happening today as the subject line. You'll notice that wasn't the winner of the test, that there was a slightly larger percentage of people who opened the one with the sign, this is it. Um, when I made the decision on which one to launch, the breaking critical vote happening today was actually slightly ahead. So over time, um, you know, as a couple of days passed, the, um, uh, the results changed a little bit between the top two, but not a huge amount. And so either one of those were probably strong subject lines to use. And you'll find this as you're doing your testing, that you have to make a decision at some point, and down the road the results may change slightly, but usually uh, it, nothing, dramatically, nothing dramatically different happens uh, with a little extra time. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go through these slides. If you want to do testing with your list, and again, I definitely encourage it because uh, getting those higher open rates and those higher click-through rates are important not only for avoiding spam filters, but for uh, engaging people in the issues uh, and getting them to take action. Um, here's how you do it. Salsa has a really nice built-in tool, and that tool is on the summary tab when you're sending out a message, again, with the full version of the email tool, and if you don't have these tabs in Salsa, then you should ask the person who manages your chapter about that so you can uh, get them if you're interested in using them. And then down here, there's a section of that summary tab, which you may have noticed, called AB Split Test Blast. So if, once you've got your message completely set up, so you've created your blast, got the content, You've done your targeting. You need to do your targeting before you uh, do your testing. You've checked it, checked uh, the message, uh, done all your proofreading. It's ready to go. You click on this link, which says Create A-B Split Test Blast to set up your test. Now, a quirky thing about this is once you click that link, you get an explanation of what it means to create tests. And then another button that says Create A-B Split Blast. In order to actually do the test, you have to click on that button. So first you collect on the link, and then the button appears, and you click on the button that says Create A-B Split Blast. Now once you've done that, you get a screen that tells you how much of your list will receive each test and then the main blast. So what this means is that by default, it's 5%. So 5% of your list, a random 5% of your list, will get your, the, what you put for test A. A different 5% will get what you put for test B. And that will leave 90% of your list to get the main blast once you've decided what to send. So I want to just um, talk about this for an additional second or two because um, what you're doing here is testing a message to decide what to send when you send the message to most of the recipients. You're not splitting the list in half and testing and then saying, oh, that was interesting, next time I'll learn a lesson and do it differently. This is sort of a live test. You're testing a portion of your list to who's going to receive the message in order to make a decision about what the best version of that message is to send. Um, and that's really great. Uh, because it helps you with those open rates. And also what uh, you'll find, I think, as you do this, is that what is true one day may not be true the next. Um, sort of, in my example, uh, the sort of very clear test 
subject lines that I had, that the one that did the best, isn't always going to be the one that does the best. Sometimes something that's a little um, less straightforward and more intriguing does better than something that sort of says straightforwardly what is going to be uh, the request in the email itself. So um, testing uh, in the moment, making decisions in the moment. You know, so occasionally you'll learn a lesson that applies more broadly, but most of the time it's, it's you know, what's working there? You know, what's working there based on what other things are ending up in people's mailboxes, what's in the news, and other things like that. So the testing is um, uh, for the message you're about to send. So then what you also get uh, is test A, test B, and the main blast. So test A, you generally just leave it as is. That's the message that you set up. That's your default. That's what you know, if you weren't going to do any testing, this is what you would send out. Test B, in this case, click on the edit link, and that's where you're going to change the subject line to test something different. So when you click on the edit link, it opens up a window where you can enter a different subject line. In this case, I'll enter the Tell Senate Democrats No Compromise subject line, which is one of the test subjects uh, that I used uh, in the earlier screen. And then you click Save This Email to save that new subject line. So once I've saved that, you can see the subject line changes to show this will be the subject line for this message. Now you can test other things other than subject line. You can make edits to the full message. I'll go back here. You can click here if you wanted to edit the full blast. So you could test things like the wording of your request to take action. If you're using buttons, you could test different button locations in your message or different colors or different photos or other things. But the most important thing and the thing that generally gets you uh, the most benefit is finding the right subject line because that's how people are making decisions about whether to just hit the delete button on your message or to open it. And so you want to get that subject line right. Um, you also want to avoid testing too many things. So you don't want to have a different subject line and a different message necessarily because that's two factors and you don't really know which one made the difference or whether a different combination would make a difference. You get very complex. You can have a lot of different test groups and test a lot of different things. But in general, you want to try to stick to one thing that you're testing uh, in order to keep it simple and to make your decision making uh, more effective. So once you've got this set up, once you've edited the test and put in a new subject line for the test, what you're going to do is you're going to click Submit Test Blast. You have to click it for each message. So you have to click Submit Test Blast for Test A, and you have to click Submit Test Blast for Test B. Do not click the big orange button that says Submit Email Blast Now because that sends to the main part of your list. So you'll click Submit Test Blast and Submit Test Blast, and then you'll wait. You'll wait for the results to come in. Um, and as the results come in, uh, they will show up on the screen. Uh, when you're looking at your list of emails, uh, an hour or two later, you can go back to the screen and see what the results were. Um, you know, generally, it's good to wait two or three hours after you launch a test to see what the results are before making your decision because the people who open your message immediately upon receiving it are often different uh, than the people who open it a few hours later. And so that could skew your results. Um, you know, I used to wait a whole day, but that's just not practical in most cases because you've got the message to ready to go out. It's a call to action. There's something going on that day. Um, you can't wait a whole day for the results to come in. And so in practice, I found that two to three hours is generally pretty representative of what the whole list is going to do and gives me enough of a basis to make a decision. And you can get really technical with this. You could you know, do all kinds of statistical analysis and means testing and to figure out which one is statistically significantly better uh, in terms of open rate or clicks. But uh, you know, in general, in day-to-day in -day use, I find that just practically eyeballing it, seeing which of the messages has the higher open rate or if I'm looking for action, the higher overall action rate, making a decision based on that and going with it. Um, really, really helps with my overall open rates 
for messages. I've uh, put a link on my resources uh, page to Salsa's explanation of how to do this A-B testing as well that has a little bit more information um, on how to uh, handle it if you're also changing content. So you can take a look at that if you're interested in more details on the testing. But once you've made a decision on which message to send, then you can either choose to leave the message as it is, so leave your default, or to replace the default with the content from one of your tests. In this case, I just did two, a test A and test B. And then once you've made that choice, you click, click Submit Email Blast Now, and that sends your message to everyone on your list who did not receive one of the test blasts. So the, in this case, the remaining 90% of the list will get the message. So that's an overview of testing and the Salsa testing tool. Uh, and like I said, I really encourage you to give it a try because it can really help uh, with your open rate. So I want to take a couple minutes to review what we've talked about in these uh, first couple sections before moving on to some other best practices. Um, so first of all, you want to send the messages to the people who most want to see them. So you can use list segmentation to do that. And then you can use testing to make sure that the messages you're sending are open by as many people as possible. You want to be careful. Segmenting your list is great, but you don't want to get so excited about segmenting that you forget some parts of your list and they never get messages. So you want to make sure that uh, in your email calendar you do have some messages that are of general interest, they're compelling uh, to the, the majority of your list, or that if you are going out to segments, that you are finding something that is of interest to each segment on your list. Because if you uh, don't email your list regularly, that can have implications um, for uh, you getting marked as a spammer down the road. Some other best practices for list management, as I said before, and it bears repeating, don't buy lists. Buying lists uh, bad and tends to get you ended up uh, is marked as a spammer. Don't use the old list that you haven't been emailing recently. Get rid of non-openers. So what that means is, is, and this is hard, this is, this is really the hardest uh, thing when you're managing an email list, is to take people off your list who have not been opening your messages. And it's really hard to see that number of people on your email list that you've worked so hard to build up over the years go down when you remove people who haven't been opening messages. But again, this is important in spam filtering because you want to have the highest percentage of people that you're sending to opening your messages. So not, not, it's, it's not the number of people. So you know, if, I, if I'm sending to 1,000 people and 10 people opening it, and I'm sending to 500 people and 10 people opening it, it may be the same 10 people. But to the internet service provider, it looks like the message I sent to only 500 people is a much more compelling message because a higher percentage of the people who received it opened it. And so that's why you get rid of non-openers on your list because it makes the overall health of your list better. Now, when you're looking at this, and again, this is a sort of a query that you would do in Salsa. Uh, that's based on people's behavior, so people who have not opened a message, you want to give them some chances to opt back into your list. So you want to email them. You've probably gotten some of these messages yourself uh, with something that says, you know, we noticed that, you know, you haven't taken action recently. We haven't heard from you lately. Do you want to stay on our list? Give them a chance to click to stay on the list so that some of those people who you may think have been non-openers they have been openers, sort of silent openers that you didn't realize because they had images turned off, um, or people who you know, were consuming the information uh, but not taking action. So you want to give them a, chance, a couple chances maybe uh, to opt back into your list before you say goodbye to them. But then to get rid of them, you just you run a query in Salsa. Uh, you may want to export them uh, in order to, to have them later in case you need to do some research on them or uh, you've made a mistake and realized you really shouldn't have deleted these folks. So you can run a query and export them. Uh, and then the query tool allows you to just remove them from your list or to mark them uh, as non-deliverable so that you're not emailing to those non-openers. 
And uh, this is not on my resource page yet, but I will add it later, which are sort of some step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that, uh, the querying to get rid of the non-openers. Um, because uh, you want to make sure to do it in a way that is, uh, you can get them back if you've made a mistake and selected the wrong folks. So uh, I'll get that up in the next couple of days on my resource list so you can have that if you're interested in doing it. Yeah, I know it's really, really hard to take that step and get rid of those folks, but it can really help uh, with your list maintenance uh, and making sure that you're as effective as possible with your list. And then the final uh, thing is that you'll want to review your list for data entry errors. Uh, and this is something um, that can help with your deliverability, uh, help with your open rates, because you're actually getting to people um, who have good email addresses. And so in this case, what you would do is that you would export your list uh, to Excel or a program where you can look at it more easily. So you probably can use Access to do this. And then you would... Uh, the place where you're most likely to be able to spot the uh, data entry errors are in the domain names. So instead of seeing gmail.com, you might see gamil.com, uh, sort of simple typos, transposition of uh, letters. And so you can split the email address into its component parts um, so that you can see the domains in one column and sort them and look through them and find the typos. Um, make the corrections and then re-upload the corrected uh, names into sources so that you have uh, a better chance of reaching these folks uh, who made typographical errors. Um, again, sort of when I say it that way, it sounds fairly simple, but it can be um, complicated, especially the uh, uh, re-uploading the information to Salsa because uh, in a lot of cases, the email may be on there both with the typo and without on your list. Uh, we find a lot of that, that you know, once when someone filled out the form, uh, they had an error and another time they had actually done it correctly when they were taking action or something. So that's another thing. It's not up on my resources list yet, um, but I'll get up there in the next couple of days. It's just sort of instructions on um, how we handle that and then a template, um, an Excel template that allow you to break the email addresses out into the name and the domain for easier uh, review and sorting uh, when you're looking for data entry errors on your list. But um, we try to uh, do that uh, with our most important uh, lists uh, about every quarter or so in order to um, make sure that we aren't uh, failing to communicate with anyone who is uh, actually a good address to find up on our list. So with that, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, if anyone has a question, you can click the raise hand button, and I will unmute you and, uh, and see what you have to say. Okay, looks like we have one question. Uh, just a second here. All right, Kieran. Yeah, hi. Um, on the testing um, part of the email list, I noticed that you're testing to a list of about 151,000 people. Our email list isn't nearly that large. Um, do you recommend like a certain size to get to before that becomes effective? Or does list size right. not matter for that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, size doesn't really matter because it's a percentage of your list. And, you know, it's a random sample, and it should be pretty representative of how the rest of your list is going to behave. Now, if it was a, you know, it's a very small uh, list or a very small segment of a list, like 25 people, you know, that's not going to make a uh, big difference. But when you're up into a few hundred uh, records or a few thousand records, then, uh, you know, it's a good thing to do, and it can, it can be... Um, really helpful. So yeah, I would say that uh, it doesn't have to be a large 100,000 uh, record list in order for it to be effective. It can be you know, 2,000 and you can still uh, get meaningful results. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're also getting some uh, uh, notes sent. Um, so let me read some of the questions. 
Um, one question is, have we ever used the salsa activist scoring to segment the list, and is it useful? I have not used the scoring uh, to segment the list. Um, I've not really even uh, looked into it, so I don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, and I know I don't, uh, I have not talked to anyone who has used it. Um, I think that really for me, uh, I know my list pretty well, and I know for any particular message, um, which part of the audience would be most receptive to it. So I have not been using the, uh, the scoring to do that or looked into the scoring. Uh, so another question that was uh, sent uh, is about pricing for salsa. Um, and so uh, I can pass that along to the AFL-CIO. Um, hi, this is Chris Hager at the AFL-CIO. Um, yeah, the AFL, we give um, CLC state feds uh, get their own chapters for free. There is not, uh, it's, there's not a fee. And I think most national unions also give it to their locals for free, but no cost at all. Uh, we definitely do regular trainings. Um, so if you just reach out to me, this is Chris Pengott, um, C-K-E-N-N, -N, as in Nancy, G-O, at AFLCIO.org. That's C-K-E-N-N-G-O-T-T. -T at AFLCIO.org, we can get you set up with a chapter. This is for state, state and CLC. We can get you set up with a chapter right away um, and help get you into a training. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, and then we have another question, which is how do you handle opt-in if you want to make a list of reporters? Do you need consent before you enter the email address into your system? Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, reporters are just like uh, any other people. And in fact, they may be even more likely if they uh, got a message they weren't expecting from an organization uh, to click on the much dreaded report as spam button um, and to report it as a spam message. So you would not want to upload those into Salsa uh, in order to send them to reporters. There are, I know, I'm, um, there are systems out there that are specifically geared for distributing things like press releases. Um, where that's less of an issue because reporters are expecting to get press releases from the system. But you don't want to sort of put a list in Salsa, sort of a cold call list of reporters and just start emailing them. That's also um, you know, true of other groups of people uh, like Hill staff. You don't just want to sort of stick a list like that into Salsa and start emailing them from a bulk email system because um, that's the kind of thing that could definitely get you in trouble. Um, so you'll want to either get them to sort of agree um, or use some other kind of uh, tool that's more designed for that sort of thing. Uh, and then we have another message that says that uh, uh, folks couldn't quite hear about Salsa's cost. Um, so uh, Salsa is made available by the AFL-CIO to state feds and CLCs um, at no cost. Yes, there's, there's no cost to state and local organizations. If you're a local union, you should go see your, you should talk to your national union about getting your own chapter. And I'm pretty sure that no um, national unions charge their locals for the use of the tool. So basically, any state or local organization gets salsa for free. You just simply have to connect with your national union, whether that's the AFL-CIO, you know, CWA, AFSCME, or one of the many others that give the tool to their locals. But there's no cost. Yeah, at CWA, we give the tool to our locals at no cost. There's just certain uh, policies and procedures they have to agree to um, as part of using the tool among the policies and procedures is not to buy lists um, and, and upload them to Salsa. So that's, um, that's what we do there. Um, You, why don't you follow up with me offline? Um, sometimes it's complicated with where an organization fits in, and it's better if I have a conversation with you. So my email address, Chris Kendot, that's C-K-E-N-N is -N in Nancy, G-O-T-T -T at AFLCIO.org. Great. Thanks, Chris. And then, Sasha, I see that you have a question. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So um, I was listening to you talk um, a bit about, uh, you know, the, the downfall of buying lists, and I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the, the sort of pro tips for 
how to build a list organically. And kind of the second part of that question is um, if you could, uh, you know, have any thoughts about sharing lists or what that could look like. Yeah, great. That's a perfect question. Um, so building lists organically. Um, I would say my two biggest tips for building lists organically are, one, to create actions that people really, really want to participate in. Um, so by getting people to participate in your online campaigns, um, you're gathering the information organically, you're getting a lot of data often because people are also giving you uh, their home addresses, so you're getting really good information to do the segmentation future. So, you know, a lot of, most of the campaigns that we run are uh, directly connected to issues that are topical, that we really do need action on, but every once in a while, I might do a campaign that isn't the most urgent campaign in the world, but that I know will be really, really appealing for people to participate in. And so, um, you know, across the labor movement, campaigns that involve being angry at Walmart tend to do really, really well. Um, so, you know, that may not be the most burning issue for you or for your uh, union at the moment, but if it's a campaign that someone else is running um, and you can sort of hop on and modify it for your own purposes and help contribute to that effort at the same time doing some list building, that can be a really, really good um, choice to make. Let me, this is Chris Kegat again. Let me just say, because um, I feel a lot with, um, Whenever somebody does buy a list, I'm the one who actually has to deal with the fallout uh, because a lot of times um, we get shut down by spam blockers and I get the frantic calls. Uh, we've been basically kicked off salsa before because of it. Generally, we get a really good white list um, uh, report that we're, we're generally have a, a, you know, seen as a very good emailer. Um, but these other issues do crop up where somebody purchases a, a list. Let me tell you what happens. Um, they're seeded with fake emails, and so they alert places like Hotmail, you know, Gmail, that someone purchased a list. It's a big, it's a big no-no, and it's not just your organization that gets kicked off. Everybody does. Um, and so I can't stress enough how important it is uh, that you think about organic ways to build your list. But to speak to what Beth just said, um, with actions and things like that, we know that you know statistically. People who who actually um, sign up online, either through your website, through some kind of web form, or through an action, are going to be um, much more of a valuable activist that will continue to take action. Uh, they're just much better quality emails, and it's a slow process. It's hard work. You got to keep coming up with your actions and really getting your list involved. But those are going to create the best. Um, those are going to create the best uh, long-term. Activist. If you purchase a list, it's going to be terrible quality to begin with. You're going to get hardly any open rates. You're going to get a lot of spam complaints. I know it's very tempting to do it, and people do do it. It happens. Um, but honestly, it, in the end, it may not be worth any of the money that you spent to buy the list because the quality of the, a the activists are going to be so low. You're going to hardly get any long-term uh, new members out of it. Yeah, and just um, to sort of talk a little bit more about those organic opportunities, for us, um, the, the best um, opportunity we ever have uh, to do organic list growth is during bargaining because people want to sign up to get those bargaining notices, and so they do. Um, people are fired up. Um, they're usually angry about something that's been proposed by the company at the bargaining table. Um, and so doing things like not only asking people to sign up to get bargaining updates, uh, because maybe you don't have a program that's actually sending out bargaining updates. Some bargaining committees still are a little bit squirrely about sharing information, but you could have uh, sort of a very uh, generic uh, sort of look of um, the, the framework for bargaining, the demands of bargaining, and ask people to sign on um, uh, a petition that reiterates those demands or to, to be a co-sponsor of a piece of legislation. Um, that, that you're sort of a citizen co-sponsor of something that's a very popular piece of legislation uh, for your union. So those are some kinds of uh, the ideas of doing uh, the organic list building, but sort of finding popular advocacy campaigns. But again, if you really want to focus, if you're an a affiliate or a local and you want to focus on finding your members, um, finding things that are tied to bargaining um, or issues that are specific to you and setting up campaigns that get people to sign on to those lists can be a really great way uh, to build your membership list um, and to take advantage of those opportunities as they present themselves. Um, and 
was, oh, and the, then there's a question about list sharing. Um, so uh, list sharing can also be dangerous uh, for some of the same reasons that buying lists can be, because you're not really sure uh, where that list came from and what the practices were of the people who did, person who's giving you the, that list. So they could inadvertently give you a list that included a bunch of uh, addresses that had been bouncing for years and years and years, and they didn't really know it, and they gave it to you. Um, so what I prefer to do when I'm working in coalition with organizations um, is to do an opt-in. So I ask them to send a message on my behalf um, asking people to opt in to my list. So, um, or to, to set up a campaign and ask people to direct people to my campaign um, and list build that way because they have joined my campaign. So those kind of relationships tend to lead to higher quality uh, names on my list and sort of an outright exchange. Um, sort of, you give me your list, and I'll give you mine, and we'll just email the heck out of them. Now, there's a different sort of model out there that I just want to mention, uh, which is the model um, of things like the Move On Petition Tool and Care2, um, where you uh, enter into agreements uh, with those organizations uh, to set up petitions on their site. They will recruit from their own list people to, to sign up for those petitions, and then afterwards you get to download those names. Uh, in a lot of cases, and um, treat them as your own. That's very different. That's that's like organic list acquisition, and that's a good thing to do. Um, so if you've not checked out the Move On petition tool, um, that's a really good one that's out there. That if you um, help grow Move On's list by having a very compelling petition, then you can have access to those names um, and and bring them into your own system and use them. So that's another good place to go to look for for lists. So. Uh, does that answer most of your questions, Sasha? Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? People can raise their hands. All right. If we don't have any other questions, then it's just about 4 o'clock. Uh, and I think we can wrap it up. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, this training uh, will be up, the slides, uh, and the recording of the training will be up on the One U Digital Training page uh, uh, in a few days. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>